Welcome to this uh, book discussion. We're going to talk about my Unlocking Leadership Mind Traps, the book by Jennifer Garvey Berger. My name is Jason Scott Montoya. I'm with my friend Chris Onzai. Say hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, we both read the book, and, uh, and this book and the content in it are so relevant to the situation that we find ourselves in with this coronavirus crisis and the pandemic and the economics and the political politics and the religious and all of the elements to sort of intersect into this big old chaotic situation. So we're going to jump into this and, and see where we end up and hopefully we can share some insights and ideas and applications that'll help you navigate the uncertainty that we all find ourselves in. What, what do you say, Chris? Sound good? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's, get, let's dive in, I guess. All right. So the book again is called Unlocking Leadership Mind Traps how to thrive in complexity. And the reality is before the situation happened, we as humans in a large global economy and interrelated countries and societies and communities and individuals, it's a very complex world that we find ourselves in and things just got sort of gasoline poured on them. So it's escalated. So we wanna jump into this book by Jennifer Garvey Berger. Um, you can check it out online. But um, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a summary of what's in here, and then we're going to start talking about it. So before I jump in, I wanted to read a little passage from the introduction. And uh, just to kind of see if this is relevant to you, you know, what, how do you respond when you hear this? But this is from, from Jennifer. She says, if your life is feeling more complex, less predictable, and more confusing than it used to, and if you're finding that your reflexes are sometimes leading you astray, this book is meant to help you understand why and how to make changes that will make your life easier, that will make the increasing complexity your friend rather than your enemy. So we're gonna go ahead and jump in. There are five of these mind traps in the book. I'm gonna just quickly survey them and then we'll kind of dive into each of the five in, in more detail. Um, so the first one is what are called simple stories. So we're trapped by simple stories. And simple stories means our desire for a simple story blinds us to the real one. So we get a little bit of information and we shape a story around that without actually fully understanding all the variables. And often our biases play into that. The second is then, uh, the second one we fall, trap we fall into is rightness. And just because it feels right, doesn't mean it is right. So the feeling and whether it is right are two disconnected pieces, but often we, um, we make them the same. So we feel like this is right, then we think it is right, but often that's not the case. So uh, I see you have a friend back there who's the little- Oh, yes. <laughs> this is my cat, Highway. Uh, Highway. My... Highway. Oh, that's good. So uh, uh, the third is trapped by agreement. We are longing for, a, uh, for agreement robs us of good ideas. And this is sort of the sense that, um, you know, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna be disliked. We don't wanna rock the boat. And so we actually, lean towards agreement rather than disagreeing, which through disagreement can actually lead to more ideas and some often uh, better ideas. The fourth is uh, we're trapped by control. Um, trying to take charge strips you of influence. So essentially, you know, we, uh, at least me, uh, a recovering uh, control freak, probably still am in a large degree, but that control, when I assert it, especially in different ways or with different people, um, I can actually lose influence with those people. So there's a wiser, better way to approach those situations. And then the last trap that we fall into is trapped by ego. Shackled to who, you, who we are now, we can't reach for who will be next. And this is definitely an opportunity for us to change in this situation that's changing our environments and our way we work and the way we live. And so we have an opportunity to change, um, but our ego can hold us back and we can resist that. With a lot. So anything you would uh, add in terms of those quick little summaries, uh, Chris? I think you, you covered them. Um, just a, uh, something general to say is um, what I found most surprising was that um, these mind traps are, are always with us and it's yes. more yeah. of a fluid thing than, oh, I recognize it and I can fix it forever. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be falling into these mind traps unintentionally all the time um, what this book helps you with is recognizing when we do fall into those mind traps yes uh, which which I quite enjoyed yeah yeah and that's um it's helpful to understand because 
the, tr the, the traps are actually sort of manifestations of, of what Garvey calls quirks, sort of these tendencies that we have as humans. And in certain situations, those tendencies can actually be useful, but in complexity, that's, that's when they backfire. And so understanding they're happening and then recognizing when and how we need to adapt to those. So, um, so let's go ahead and jump into, we'll start with simple stories. Um, our desire for a simple story blinds us to the real one. And I want to go ahead and start this discussion out with, um, well, we'll, we'll read some stuff through in, in the book. But um, the idea is that our, you know, our, our automatic stories are, pr are probably too simple. And right now in this situation, this pandemic we find ourselves in, um, the, the, the crisis, there's sort of two camps that are starting to form which is one is the viral camp. <laughs> Maybe that's a, a, not the right word to use, but essentially people that are concerned about the virus, its effects in terms of the getting the virus and people getting sick and people dying. And essentially that's the story. That's the big story. And it is a part of the story. I'm going to go ahead and show uh, just a graph to kind of share um, what, this, uh, what this looks like here. So let me go ahead and do this. Um, do you see that here? Yep. Okay, so this graph here, I'm going to go to the newest version. Um, you can see here in this top part of the United States, you can see this graph shows the deaths per million, um, the causes of death in America. And the red line is, is COVID-19 over the eight weeks that we've been tracking it. And then the other lines show the number of people that die from heart disease and cancer and, and whatnot. And so when you look at this graph, it's, it's pretty dramatic, essentially, because you see this red line go up and above all of the other causes of death. And essentially, it's a skyrocketing uh, increase. And, and then you see a little bit of a dip, um, which has been a result of you know, the social distancing. Mm -hmm. So story one is, wow, this is really horrific, the, this being a cause of death and, and the scale that this could become if we just let it happen, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of one story that we can fall into, which is this is the only, the only piece that we need to consider. And then the second part of it is, is the economic cost. And I think the unemployment is a great way to sort of visualize this. Um, you can look in this graph, essentially you've got unemployment, you know, just at a few percent. And then all of a sudden we started doing the social distancing and the containment and it just skyrocketed. And each week it's been another three, four million people um, applying for unemployment, which is just a signal among many of what's happening in the economy. Um, and different companies are, are, are having different impacts based on what type of industry they're in and the type of business they're in. So restaurants, you know, they're struggling, right? And yep. so, yeah, there's a, there's a health issue, um, but there's an economic issue. And so as a, in terms of the simple story, we can, we can sort of say, well, we need to just can, we need to just shelter in place for the next year until this is dead or gone. And then others say, well, we got to get to work because I don't have money, you know, to do this or that. And so here we kind of fall into that. So what, what are your thoughts there, you know, uh, Anze, anything that comes to mind when you, when you see these? And this will kind of be some of the, one of the, the ways we frame the discussion as we go through here. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's an easy way for people to kind of wrap their heads around what's happening. Um, yeah. We're always looking for some sort of reason, cause and effect. Yeah. Um, sort of, uh, where um, sometimes that's not really that, that helpful and can be definitely polarizing, you know, yeah. maybe unnecessarily po polarizing. Um, one thing that one story that Garvey had, had mentioned in, in her book, uh, or Garvey Burger, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, um, was uh, about the uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, disaster. You know. Okay. Yeah. Refresh and, us on what that was, and. Um. So. Oh man, I don't remember. I think it's on page twenty-seven. Do you have the book there? It looks like twenty-seven. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. What year was that? Um, I don't quite remember the year, but yeah. it's when the tsunami and um, subsequent yeah nuclear meltdown of the of the power plant as a result of that yeah as a result in japan um you and know, there was a 9.0 earthquake yeah yeah it was a huge earthquake that caused a huge tsunami that flooded the reactor and mm. um it started to melt down well you know 
history tells us that, you know, um, there, there could have been a number of reasons why that, that could have happened, but, um, you know, researchers are, she even says researchers are drawn to create a story, generally a simple one that focuses on one chain of cause and effects. Mm. And once we have a simple story in place, we try to use that to reward the heroes and punish the villains and ensure that uh, yes. never happens again. So, And that, that I have that highlighted as well. So yeah. that's, it's very interesting that when we have the story, when we have the narrative, um, that we do create those heroes and villains. And we're so quick to be a part of the heroic side, right? The, right. Um, and, and villainize the other. Um, what, what's, what's going on there? Why are we doing that? <laughs> I think it's, it's because, um, you know, it's a easy to follow narrative, you know? Um, and but is, some... what do you think is motivating? Like far, part of it for me is, is that, is it give us kind of, a sense of comfort like I'm in control because I now yes. know where I stand in the situation uh, comfort and and kind of general understanding okay well clearly you know that that thing is a bad thing and it kind of it kind of to me also um relates to morality a little bit yeah like you know if I know exactly this you know, who is the villain and who is the good guy, then, then I know where my moral standing is. And, you know, I yeah. want to, I want to side with the, the heroes. And yeah. Stuff. And, and that's something that can happen in, you know, in terms of like historically, that's sort of in terms of 9-11, right? The, the hijackers, they saw themselves as the hero and they saw America as the villain. Right? Absolutely. And then we, I mean, we, we kind of reciprocated in the sense that we saw them as the villain and we went to war. Right. So, yep. and that's something that, can we continue to persist in and and see that's the the hard part about it is it's not that you it's just a complex thing you know that these this happened and and how are we going to respond and and i think we can do it a lot more emotionally than than we can diligently absolutely yeah it's not uh, that we shouldn't respond but it's often how we respond. <laughs> it's, it's also um, kind of making sense of things. So, so um, she also talks about um, like our human mind wants to see patterns in things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here, here's another quote. Uh, yeah. you know, if there are random dots scattered somewhere, we'll create patterns name them and create stories about them. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's just like our human nature. It kind of yeah. reminds me of a, a, a class I took in, in college, a psychology class, and it was a bunch of dots together that formed a shape. Yeah. And the professor just, you know, like clearly looked at us and said, you're not looking at a square, you're looking at a bunch of dots. Mm. And it kind of like messed with us a little bit. We're like, no, we, we see the dots forming a square. Yeah. But no you're looking at dots yeah they just happen to be placed and your mind is connecting them yeah so it's, yeah, it's kind of that yeah that's interesting because um you know when i think about we can start to and then our i think our biases and our beliefs and our experiences can shape that like you could see a square i could see a triangle probably in certain situations, absolutely you know, yeah right? so and, and we don't necessarily understand each other's point of view to be able to really wrap our minds and so then it's like i don't understand you so then i'm gonna uh, condemn you maybe right. um but yeah that that i you know and I, I i can see myself in past scenarios you know where i could i could kind of connect those dots and i am a connector like personality wise and sort of just i like to connect things and right. problem solve and figure out how they how they work together right so um so there's a benefit to the connecting in, in certain contexts but when i connect it in a way where you know i uh, there are things i believed and thought in the past that that were just so conflated or so shallow in their their foundation that um, i was i was it was conjecture in a lot of ways you know <laughs> right so so it's interesting yeah the dot connect will connect the random dots and we can you know, we see this in the political realm right now it's just people are they see a little bit of pieces of evidence and so i highlighted on on page 30 at the top you know to create our simple stories, we pick and choose the data we remember. Yes. We add in little bits of data if it makes for a better case, but we tend to ignore or dismiss um, the, the evidence that contradicts us. 
And so one of the things that I've, I've been doing over the last couple of years um, to kind of combat that is, is to really, to really have a grounded um, understanding and belief and behavior from that belief is to, to understand the best argument against my argument. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and, and kind of figure that out and wrestle with that and go, okay, what is that? And it's very hard and it takes a lot of energy. So it's not something we normally do, which is why we end up falling in the trap. Right. But I've been trying certain situations. I've been trying to just like, okay, I want to understand it from, from a really an anchored point of view or from the other person's point of view who is very anchored in that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, This is going to be totally off the wall random, but um, have you ever read Ender's Game? Uh, So I've seen the movie. Um, Okay. So, I, but it's only you know the first book, um, and actually, it's funny you mention that. That there are a couple of movies. Um, the way that they end, or something that happens in them, is like very disturbing. And the end of that story was very disturbing to me. I it yeah it still yeah. bothers me to this day. You know, it is a very thing very resonates. jarring. Yeah, but anyways, you would tell so us, well. Tell us. One of the um, one of the concepts that Ender kind of. Uh, realizes or, or, or learns is that, you know, when he is fighting the enemy, um, his tactic is to know them so much that, mm. that he loves his enemy. So it's, there's, oh, okay. there's some sadness when, but um, the, the, the way, the reason why I bring that up is like, you know, you're kind of taking that approach. So, you know, somebody that's perceived with a different viewpoint or an enemy, if you will, you want to know their, uh, reasoning why they're um, saying the things that they're saying. Um, in Ender's case, it was to use that information to kind of destroy them. Yeah, know, yeah. To kind of get to know them so that he can find their weaknesses, how they think, their tactics, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So in in a, in a sense, you are kind of strengthening some of your position and even po- possibly even changing it when you are yeah. looking at, a, you know, alternative viewpoints, especially mm-hmm. ones that are kind of challenging your beliefs. So I yeah. definitely like and that I th- a lot. I think that's why um, it's interesting, you know, to sort of have a, a larger pursuit, you know, even even a, for truth over what I believe in the sense that there's got to be something that carries me beyond that thing that could be wrong, right? <laughs> and so um, pursuing truth as opposed to being right it may mean a lot of times I'm wrong, which then kind of d- dives into the ego and, and other things that we're going to ex- discuss. But absolutely, but yeah. um, I think you, and maybe that kind of gets. We're going to talk about the latter at the end. I think that's part of it as well. Is there's got to be something that pulls us out of that, that because um, we can sort of navigate these traps. But I think to to sort of to to be more effective, it takes something that transcends them. Transcends, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, um. I think the other interesting thing, so I'll kind of sort of walk through myself um, in the terms of the simple story and, and even, even as I'm trying to navigate not being caught in simple stories, I can still fall into that. So, you know, when this coronavirus situation started to unfold, I think there was a sense that I, you know, it's a thing that's happening. You know, we've had stuff like this in the past in my lifetime, you know, there's, but it, it would never impacted America in a real way you know, you have the flu, you have all these things. Yeah. Um, it, this is a once in a century thing. So it's just not even on my radar. I'm not thinking about it. don't even know about it. And I think there was a sense of, I put a simple story on it that, okay, it's just something over there. It's not going to affect us or me move on with my life. You know, <laughs> I don't know how, how did, did you, did yeah. you feel differently with the first time you kind of heard about um, it or did well, you, I'm a little weird that I kind of take some of these things um, a little bit more seriously than I should, but um, you know, I had some of those feelings too, like, oh, okay, this is just like another bird flu or Zika or swine flu, you know, it can be bad. But then when I started hearing about deaths and, yeah, um, you know, I was really searching for information on this. There was like zero information mm-hmm. when it first came out. Yeah. Uh, that's when I started to be a little bit concerned. I'm like, why aren't, where, why, where is there more uh, information? Okay. So the this? lack of information is what made you concerned. Interesting. Yeah, that, that kind of alerted me. Okay, there's something going on here, but that could just be my weird reptilian yeah. conspiracy. Yeah, well, I think for me it was a little different. I think it was more information was what pulled me into it. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. 
I think I, I can't quite remember the timeline, but I feel like it wasn't until Italy started to have some some mm. issues. So we had China, yeah. but I think I dismissed it a little bit because it's China, and it's like what's real and what's not. Um, right. And Italy's like, okay, this is a little bit more real, um, and I think that's I. I th- I think that's kind of when it started to pivot for me, but it was more information. And then once I started to feel like, okay, there's something here, then I kind of lean into that. It's like, okay, I want to know what's going to happen as quickly as possible yeah. so I can respond. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was really interesting to see how different countries responded to the, mm-hmm. to the virus too. And, you know, I was wondering like, okay, are we going to kind of learn from these different yeah. hotspots? Um, and in some ways we did, in in some ways we we didn't. <laughs> yeah, in some ways we still need to, you know. Right, absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's and that's the thing, you know. If we talked about this a little bit, just you know, some of the countries that have responded well, like South Korea and whatnot, uh, as one example, they they had SARS. What was it, in two thousand four or something? Yeah. And um, they got a test run, if you will, in in a, in a sense. And so they they learn from that and they change their systems. And and we've all had those same type of warnings because we witness that and, and our country has tried to do stuff over the last few decades but apparently it was not not the right things so um or not all of the right things not enough of the right things um to really ha- allow us to be prepared and so um so yeah it's interesting to see different countries and then the other thing that was really interesting fascinating to me at the beginning was who different approaches okay our country yeah. and, a, and a majority of countries we're going to take a shelter in place approach sort of um we're going to sort of let it die down and then we'll get ready for it. And then we'll sort of go through the cycles that follow. And then England and, um, and I think, uh, sweet Switzerland, um, or, um, there, there's another country. They essentially said, we're going to just, we're going to let us, we're all going to get the virus sort of just go through the process, mm. get the virus, protect the vulnerable. Um, and, and then we'll sort of get sort of like swallowing the pill uh, the big pill, get it out of the way and move yeah. forward. And we'll sort of uh, uh, assume that the immunity we get will create immunity um, across the people. So and everyone else is going to have to do that anyway. So we're just going to get it out of the way. Yeah. And so England was doing that. They buckled and they followed everyone else. But I think it's it's Switzerland, one of the countries with an S, maybe Sweden or Switzerland. <laughs> but one of them is actually continuing to do that. Um, and we'll see how that plays. But it was a, it was really interesting to, for me because it was two different approaches. They were essentially two beliefs or two paradigms on how to respond to the situation. And there isn't like a, um, you, you can do a little bit of one and, and a little bit of the other. You kind of have to go all in on, on both of them. Right. And, and that's actually one of my concerns now is that our country is going to kind of bounce back and forth from the two, but we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. So, yeah. Um, but that was, a, that was a milestone for me in terms of how this unplayed is, okay, now, now it's affecting us what's the approach and mm-hmm. i think the simple story there is you know it's you have to do it one way or the other but the reality is we don't really know which one is the better right, right. yeah <laughs> um we're guessing in a lot of these cases right mm-hmm. so let's talk a little bit about keys to unlock simple stories and then we'll jump to rightness so um if we fall into a simple story and a way to do that is if we start to think of ourselves as a hero and someone else as a villain, that's a pretty easy way to do it. If we start to get angry at somebody else because they're on a different point of view, yeah, absolutely. the way we can help, the key question we can ask ourselves is, how is this person a hero in their own story? Mm. So maybe we hate Trump. Well, ask yourself, how is Trump a hero in his story? What 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 is motivating him to make the decisions he's doing, which you might hate? Yeah. Or maybe it's... Um, you know, I know a lot of people have not liked Bill Gates. All of a sudden, he's become a villain in this story, or Dr. Fauci. I don't know how to say You know, he's become a villain. Yeah. Ask yourself, how are they a hero in their story? And, Absolutely. And, and let that be um, something where you sort of operate with generosity and understand their point of view. And perhaps you could learn something. And perhaps you could get a better more comprehensive story. So any, any thoughts on that? Question? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a, a great way to kind of build empathy. Um, okay, so yeah. I was in customer service for, for years. Um, and, you know, I, we would have a lot of angry customers, um, mm. you know, you know, many times a day. Um, one of the coping mechanisms I had was to kind of figure out, okay, 
they're not mad at me. They're mad at the situation. So how can I make the situation right for them so they can yeah. calm down? Because, you know, I don't, you know, I always ask questions like, okay, so maybe their boss yelled at them or maybe they just had a really bad day. Their kid threw a tantrum or something and they're yeah. just kind of venting their frustration. So, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, Chris, don't take it personally. They're having a rough day. Your job is to make their day better. Like yeah. let's figure out yeah. how to resolve the situation. But in order to do that, you know, you have to ask, you know, you know, how are they the hero of the story? You know, what are they trying to, to accomplish? Mm -hmm. What problem are they trying to solve? So yeah. and absolutely. How, and that can help us help them do that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cause then you can start, um, you know, if you don't have that, you know, simple story could also lead to kind of a narrow mindset, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, this, this is the only way that, that the problem can be solved and yeah. that's it. Cause you know, that's the story that I know. But if you kind of take into account the other person's story, then, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, well maybe if we try this or if we yeah. try that, because this, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we'll get to that in, in the third one, but yeah, there's more, there's potentially a better solution to, to the simple story solution that actually addresses those concerns and, and addresses other concerns as well. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so the, in terms of, so that's the key question is how is this person that I'm seeing as a villain, how are they mm -hmm. a hero in their own story? And then the second thing is the key, what, uh, the key habit. So each, each of these traps has a key question and a key habit. The key habit is to carry three different stories. So when you text someone and you start to stress out, that they didn't reply that they don't like you, whatever, da, 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 da. <laughs> Carry, maybe that's a possibility, but carry two other stories. One that says they didn't see it. Um, another is that they're just really busy and they'll get to it later. Um, you know, that's a, a simple story. story. Right. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, the news reports we see every day. Okay, that's a possibility. Let's look at what are the other options, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It, um, just on that note, like I find it super helpful to look at um, reporting by other countries just to kind of get their perspective on, on what's yeah. happening. Like on, like, for example, if I'm looking at an article that's specifically about the United States, so maybe I'll jump over to BBC or um, the South Korean news yeah. station. Let's yeah. just see like, what, what are their, okay. what are their takeaways on what's going on? Exactly. And I, I, you know, I look at conservative and liberal news sites and I'm trying to get both sides of it because I know they're going to be biased. And so if I do both, I can get more, more, uh, more of it. But again, I might have a tendency towards one side or the other, but, but yeah, that's, um, you know, again, how do we, how do I burst my own bubble, you know, and how do I get a better understanding? And we're going to have to make judgments without a lot of, you know, with limited information. Yeah, so absolutely. It's going to be hard, but we can at least be somewhat wise about it and non-emotional, I think. Yeah, and, and I think in a way that carrying those three stories like kind of reduces anxiety a little bit because you're not just worried about a single outcome, you know? Yeah, kind of, yeah, that's interesting. I know, think there's not, a lot of anxiety we get because we don't do that. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. we, we, say, we just think like worst case scenario or like, okay, well, yeah, yeah. that's terrible. Well, what if, what if it wasn't? Let's entertain yeah. that thought yeah. for a second and then. Yeah. yeah. Or what if it was, but we could actually respond in a way that would be, yeah. I mean, it's just, there's so many, yeah. so many options. And I, that's the thing for anxiety, at least for me is I, you know, I know that's different for different people in different seasons, but um, I think I struggle more with the uncertainty than I do a negative or a positive certainty. Uh, like I'd rather know. know it's bad news and then I can respond than just yeah. not know, you know, I don't want to be, right. I don't want right. to be blindsided. That's sort of my anxiety is being blindsided. <laughs> yeah. I think so I, I, I have the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of why I want to know, like, this is going to be bad. I want to know how bad and let's, let's figure that out so that I at least can expect it. So, right. Um, so let me read this last piece from simple stories and then we'll jump to the next. Um, the point is to notice your simple stories. Remember they're simple believe in them less, and use this habit to multiply the options you're considering. The point is to understand that in a complex world, a simple story is just about always wrong and will just about always lead us, lead us to an emaciated, impoverished set of choices. Escape the simple stories trap for a cornucopia of possibilities in a complex world. So that's simple stories. So let's jump into the next one, rightness. Yeah. Just because it feels right doesn't mean it is right. I and mean, a lot of us are falling into this all over oh the place. Gosh. And I think part yes. of it is depending on if we've entrenched ourselves into one of these simple stories. And so I think, you know, for me, you know, the two sides, the economic and then the, the, the health 
side of it. I've probably been more sympathetic to the health side of it um, and less to the economic. But the, but the thing is, is I'm, I'm a, a virtual freelancer and my work, I can continue to do my work virtually at home. And mm. so the risk for me more is on the health side my work side isn't a risk. So it's not as felt as a problem. Right. Right. And so, um, so that's the, my tendency is, is, in, is starting to entrench, you know, entrench on that simple story that, you know, we, we need to do what we need to do to, to social distance, but I'm, I'm also being influenced by this scenario. That's not as severe as it is for the person who cannot actually work at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely tough. And I've been, I'm kind of like flip-flopping back and forth too yeah. uh, on some occasions because, uh, you know, I have a, I have a newborn, so mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to risk anything happening to her at all. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, you know, I need to have a job to support yeah. that newborn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I definitely feel it personally, but uh, you know, it's like, then you start questioning and this could be a super simple story. Like, you know, is, is life more important than, than, you know, getting a wage or yeah. is there another way around? So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, I think I, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I'm, I'm wrestling between the two. Like, yeah, yeah. I understand like the hurt of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being laid off. I've been laid off before and I, I know that feeling and yeah. that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also been sick before too, yeah. uh, in a, in a severe way actually. So, um, so I understand both perspectives and I, yeah. and I get it. And they're both, you know, I, I don't know what I would choose if forced between the two, you know? Yeah. I, I, well, and I think that's where the interesting thing is if we sort of, you know, sit with that, um, you know, we can kind of dive into that a little bit, but there, there's an opportunity to go, well, maybe there, there is a third way. Maybe there is yes. something yeah. else. Um, but let's, let, you know, I want to kind of pull in the, there's a little passage here that I'll read that, that does have to do with politics. Mm -hmm. Um and talking about rightness. So in the United States right now, in the age of Trump, there's a whole lot of rightness on both sides of the highly polarized political spectrum. And that's just been, gasoline has been poured on that with this situation. Yes. Um, and each side is baffled and horrified at the capacity of the other side to believe they're right about anything. But when you see that the sense of rightness is an emotion rather than a logic, suddenly mm -hmm. it all makes sense. In the face of what looks like weak evidence to one side, the sense that the other people believe it and think it's right seems bewildering. But the fact that people might be angry or frightened in the face of changing world seems totally understandable. Rightness is just an emotional cousin to these other reactions. So, yeah. I mean, change is hard and it just got accelerated and a lot of people, you know, we're going to resist it and different people are going to do it in different ways and some people are going to do it in, in unhealthy or in, in harmful ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that really hit me when I first read it. Like, um, you know, you normally think, okay, right is right and wrong is wrong. Um, yeah. but the feet, like we're not, it's, we're not looking at things from a purely logical standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's definitely <laughs> an emotional it, standpoint. And even you know? if we are, we still aren't, you know, like right. there's, always some underlying motivation and belief or experience like you we can't be entirely objective it's just almost impossible i think even as objective as we try to be yeah yeah um definitely i think we're, we're shaped by our experience too and mm -hmm. and yeah absolutely there's no like you know yeah and so she, world, <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i was gonna say she says uh, on page 44 it turns out that we can't tell the difference between our opinion and truth <laughs> And that yeah. shapes what we notice and how we treat other people. And that last part is, is the interesting thing is this situation mm. is illuminating um, how much we're willing to treat people differently because of what they believe, say, or do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the page 45, she says, our, our, uh, this is a quote from Daniel Kahneman. Our excessive confidence in what we believe we know and our apparent inability to acknowledge the full extent of our ignorance and the uncertainty of the world we live in. Um, believing we're right leads us to march confidently in a determined direction, which could very well be right off a cliff. And <laughs> we, we're in a situation where there's so much uncertainty in so many different 
ways and contexts and you know it a lot of us are stepping off cliffs and some of us aren't and some of us are and it's it's almost it's just a it's challenging <laughs> very yeah very challenging and uh, but I think um, the next the next thing she talks about is that you know our experience of rightness kills curiosity and openness to data to prove us wrong and I think that's mm -hmm. where it can get really dangerous is right now we need to be as curious as possible um, to be looking for solutions and opportunities and 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 not locked into anything we got to kind of hold things with our hands open to a degree and rightness just it, it gets fueled by our ego but it it kind of locks us in and into something and instead of you know i our, i'm in this we're both in the state of georgia right and so our governor has just is opening the state right for some right. reasons you yeah. talked about um and a lot of people are upset with that and a lot of the you know the president is even coming out against it and so there's sort of this tension um but there is an aspect of it that i wonder you know is the governor is he locked into his decision and his ego is actually, you know, to, to regress from that decision means he's backing down and he's, he was wrong and, and, is yeah. he, you know, or maybe he is right. You know, that's the other side of it. So it's, it's, um, it's, he, you know, I imagine if I were in that situation, it'd be really hard to, to change my mind because that would be a dynamic I'd have to, to I'd have to deal with my own ego to, to say Absolutely, I was wrong. You know? yeah. and that's a very public thing to do in, in a humiliating way. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of eyes on him and yeah, um, whether he's right or, or wrong. I mean, there's still the pressure there to make a decision, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's yeah. interesting because, you know, he may be, it's like, what are you going to do? Just not do anything. Our businesses right. are failing. Our restaurants are closing. You know, you're not going to, you're just going to sit back and do nothing. You know, I can imagine the pressure that he would be having because of that. And, you know, I think, um, so Garvey Berger said something that was interesting to me. Um, you know, a couple of pages before this, uh, yeah. on 45, he's, she says, um, uh, if we thought we were wrong most of the time, we'd be paralyzed. So, mm. you know, there's, you know, this comes kind of from like our, uh, I guess, I don't want to use this loaded term, but, you know, evolution of, of, you know, our ancestors running away from, you know, danger. Yeah. You know, Just like, like if, yeah, the simple, you know, life. <laughs> exactly. The simple life, you know, like, hey, the, the goal is to survive. You know, if we didn't have, that um i guess that emotion of being right um then we you know we'd be yeah. eaten by a saber <laughs> by a lion that we need to lion, be right that yeah. the lion there's a lion over there <laughs> absolutely so so yeah I, on one sense like you know there is a need to be right um mm -hmm. uh just an inherent need but yeah overcoming that that inherent need is where the i think what you're saying too is like that's the challenge you know like yeah. how do i how do i go against my instinct you know how do i go yeah. against you know or at least suppress it for a moment to evaluate that instinct right yeah because that instinct could be right it's just it may not be. it's just it's an instinct it's sort of directionless in a sense we've got to make sure it's pointed in the right direction absolutely yeah 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 um you know this yeah this one um <laughs> Yeah, this one, this one caught me uh, a lot because I, you know, when you recognize, oh man, you know, like when I look at past like conversations or decisions, and I'm like, okay, did I, yeah. was I actually right in that moment, or did I just feel right mm -hmm. in that moment, you know? Well, and and that's the I think one of the hard things, you know, that I I feel when I have to sort of wrestle with this is, for me, um, you know, to acknowledge that I was wrong, it, it's it's not just acknowledgement in the moment but it's also acknowledging my past in a way so you know if i've been wrong about something for three years i'm having to sort of swallow that i just was telling people the wrong thing for three years you know that's yeah. a hard thing to accept <laughs> it is yeah it is um it's kind of like that um have you seen memento yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah the the whole concept the whole mm. movie you know like and then at the end, he's, um, spoiler alert, you know, yeah. yeah, he gets the revelation. Oh man. Uh, yeah. I'm he was the one 
that did yeah. it. Yeah. He's the one that did it. And they're like, oh, I'm going to co- continue like living the lie, you know, yeah. because I can't, I can't wrestle with the truth. Mm-hmm. I can't the handle denial. the truth. Yeah. 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 So, that's a, yeah. that's a good example. I like that. Um, in the, in the book, she talks about an uh, example of uh, doctors washing hands. Like for a while, they did not do that. And a lot of people died yeah. and got hurt. And yeah. uh, today, of course, the idea that doctors should wash their hands is totally obvious and has saved millions and millions of lives. But back then it was absurd. And so doctors thought they were right. They felt they were right. Yeah. But it doesn't mean they are right. Right. And, and they, it's they true for any of us. <laughs> justified it with science and facts. You know, yeah, that's yeah. the other kind of crazy part. You know, like... The, another great example is is uh, smoking, where doctors mm. were you know recommending smoke, it. Yeah, yeah, re- <laughs> like bad. it's super healthy. And, you know, you know, nine out of ten doctors recommend this brand of cigarettes, and it's, and then it turns out, oh man, like it had all these negative consequences. Yeah, yeah. it makes you kind of stop and wonder and and think like, uh, you know, about like these universal truths that we have now. It's like, are they really true? Or yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and that's the Apostle Paul. I love what he says when he says, test everything, hold on what, to what's good. And, yes. and the idea is, you know, we don't know exactly. So, you know, wrestle with it, figure it out. Like I mentioned earlier, if you can figure out the best counter argument and then look at the best argument and then make your decision based on those. And so I've actually become less um, interested in straw manning. I want, mm. I want a steel man argument on both sides and then let me make my decision, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um william lane craig he, he when he does his debates that's really how he goes about it he sort of evaluates all the options and and then comes up with uh, his conclusion but it's it's built on on you know steel manning all of these arguments and then picking the one that's mm. best so um but i think we kind of you kind of have to get to the point where you're like okay I'm, i don't want to live in denial i want to know the truth and i and even if it's a terrible truth and then i want to know that over not over being in you know, an ostrich head in the sand kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, she does talk about, you know, the way we can respond when someone confronts us, there's three ways. And really we do one or one or uh, the first two, and we can hopefully seek to be more of the third, but the first is defensive, but confident. So, you know, I'm right, but I'll, you know, I'll sort of, uh, um, I'll defend myself, you know, and confidently so. And then the other is annoyed and offended, you know, uh, he's, com- he's, he's challenging me again, you know, but the one we ought to be is open and curious. Oh, okay. Tell me why you think I'm wrong. I mean, that's just, it's hard to say that it's hard to do that, especially in the moment where you're not even like thinking it's just someone challenges you and you're getting, yeah. get defensive. Right. At least that's me. I don't know if you feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes like when, when I'm passionate about like a topic or, or, um, you know, when, when I feel wronged or something, mm-hmm. I get super, my, my mind goes into defensive argumentative mode where yeah. like, when somebody's speaking, I'm trying to pick apart, you know, what they're saying. Uh, like you're uh, thinking about how to respond versus listening to what they have to say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which, which she, she brings up as well, which we yeah. can talk about. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, absolutely. I, I get that way. And I'm like, uh, you know, and then I recognize it after the fact. I'm like, oh man, um, yeah, I wasn't very open there, you know. Yeah, um, it's hard. I mean, yeah, it's hard. I think you got to have someone that you can kind of work that out with that you mm, trust because it's hard to yeah. do with someone that's difficult to do that. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and that trust has to be there because you know um, that's really you know one of the only ways you can get past that because because all you're thinking is like this this guy's out to get me or attack Mm -hmm. me or attack my uh you know my personal beliefs or yeah who i am Mm -hmm. you know when really it's more like okay they don't i don't understand where they're coming from and i need to find out why they think Mm -hmm. why they believe what they believe yeah Um, and i think kind of again we're gonna talk about the ladder a bit at the end and but i think it's kind of part of the idea of of what she calls building a ladder is Mm -hmm. um we, we, what's the end game? I mean, what's the goal? I mean, if our, if we don't have something we're sort of aiming for, why should I care that, why can't I be defensive and, and uh, be right? You know, like yeah. the, what we're trying to say is it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit the people you care about. Right. It's going to benefit the community. It's going to benefit our world. If we sort of accept this 
uh, premise and, and lean into it. So let's jump into the, the key question, the key habit for rightness, and mm. then we'll jump to the next trap. So the key question for um, trapped by rightness is essentially asking ourselves, what do I believe and how could I be wrong? What do I believe and how could I be wrong? And that's kind of the idea that I had was sort of understanding the best counter argument, right? Um, right. One of the things I, that sort of I would add to this is what is it that I believe and what's the truth that informs that belief, okay? So I believe, you know, the sky is blue. Well, what informs that? Maybe it's, I've seen the sky and it looks blue, you know? Right. <laughs> it might be an experience or, or maybe there's like some scientific calculation that can determine the color. I, I don't know exactly, but um, by identifying the truth and the belief and how they're connected, I think it helps us to understand them and then to challenge and dissect them and to reinforce them if they're, if they're, um, you know, limited or shallow or. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and then the key habit is listening to learn, which we mentioned. The idea is not to yes. listen to respond, not listen to fix. Um, it's yeah. not to listen to win, to shut you down. It's to listen to learn, to go, okay, Chris, you said this and that. Help me understand what it is you mean. What are your assumptions? What's informing that? What's the beliefs you have? What's the truth that's informing? Like deconstruct it, right? Um, but that's, that is hard too, like <laughs> listening to learn, right? <laughs> it's definitely hard. And, um, this was probably the, this concept kind of resonated with me the most in, yeah. in the entire book. And, and, you know, I've, I've brought this up to like my friends and family, you know, when we're having conversations, like when, you know, when they're complaining about like a coworker or boss and I'm like, yeah. okay, well, you know, um, have you thought about just kind of listening to them and seeing what mm -hmm. their perspective is and yeah. um, not just, you know, being on the defensive automatically, you know, yeah. when you're, when you're talking to them. And I think that brings a lot of, a lot of insights um, just kind of when you understand where somebody's coming from, you know, you're not going to be as defensive because you're, Oh, they think that way because of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's been super helpful for me as well. Like, um, I try to consciously like, cause I'm, I'm a listen to fix kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Like um, when you tell me a problem, I'm like, okay. Okay. I I yeah. through, like, okay. I do that with, with my wife a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like Let, here, here's what you need to do. You need to call them and do this, this, and this. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And she just, she just wants to vent and, and yeah. you know, let me hear her out. And I'm, I'm here not even he hearing the words I'm, thinking yeah. about a solution to a problem that she doesn't even want solved. Yeah. So that, that gets me in trouble sometimes, but I'm yeah. more, more well, conscious. That, yeah, that's, that's good. Cause I think, um, so, and I guess sometimes it even, it's even helpful to ask that like, okay, are you wanting me to help you fix this or are you just wanting me to listen? Yes. You know, cause I think sometimes, you know, it's not that listening to fix is never appropriate. It's just right. Yeah. It's just that we never, we don't default to listen to learn. We default to listen to fix. So that's not right. the one we got to work on. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and then listening to win is really not listening at all. It's just essentially I'm trying to win the argument or I'm trying to shut you down or I'm yeah. trying to dismiss you. And it's kind of weird. I found it weird that, you know, when I talk to other people, I can immediately recognize, um, like what they're doing, like, mm. are, it, like if they're listening to fix, like I can immediately, re I can't recognize it so easily in myself, yeah. mm. but when other people are talking, yeah. I'm like, okay, this guy's. Well, know. and that's a good thing is it's, we should ask people what they want. And then we also yeah. should we call them out, which I, I know can be challenging at times, but it's like, all right, Chris, I just need you to listen to me. I don't need <laughs> you to fix it. I don't need you to dismiss it. I just need you to listen. So my wife's probably done that a lot of times to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> same here. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite, favorite parts. And I think very helpful. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, let's jump to the next one, which is trapped by agreement. So longing for alignment robs us of good ideas. Longing for alignment robs mm. us of good ideas. And I think this is actually, a, I, we are naturally, this is naturally happening. I actually think this, the okay. bipartisanship, um, the sort of the different camps politically or, mm. or just how they respond to the situation, 
Um, I think it's actually forcing a lot of conversations and discussions and exploration that may not happen if we were all in agreement, you know? So right. um, it's not always done in a healthy way and it's not always, uh, you know, yeah, it's messy. I'll put it that way. But I do think it is fostering a lot of tension and conflict that is fostering ideas. But I think the challenge and, and the challenge, you know, the idea of sort of agreement is, you know, we don't want to sort of stand in that fire. We don't want there to be that conflict. Um, we'd rather be in agreement because it, it's, it's stressful and anxiety inducing to be in when you're not in agreement. Yeah. You know? And she it's, talks about the idea that social pain, uh, she quoted uh, Matthew Lieberman, social pain from the biggies like heartbreak and rejection to the more mm -hmm. daily pain of thinking people don't like you or that you're being left out is experienced in the brain in exactly the same way physical pain is. Yeah, I highlighted that as well. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was eye-opening. <laughs> yeah. So no wonder we, we avoid it, you know? Yeah. Who yeah, likes a, pain, sorry, you know? So yeah, I don't know. What do you think, yeah. what do you think about agreement and how it applies to this? Situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll go, you know, I, I have a tendency to agree a lot um, and I'll go out of my way to agree yeah. uh, with, with things. Um, and I'm starting to notice more and more mm. and trying to like scale back, uh, especially at work when you want to be kind of, well, in my case where, where I'm working at a company yeah, uh, where you want to be seen as, um, you know, agreeable and not conflicting and mm. Um, what do you call it? Uh, you don't want to be, you know, the, the, what is it? Like the nagging or the negative or the, absolutely. Yeah. You, know, you, you just don't want to be the villain, right? We don't villain, want to be the villain. Right. <laughs> right. So you kind of, yeah. So I, I kind of like tend to, to be in that agreement mode, but then I realize, you know, um, recently, especially recently, like disagreeing kind of opens up a lot mm. of dialogue and conversations about other ideas yeah, because um, I find that um, you're doing a disservice by, first of all, just agreeing with everything because, yeah. you know, I think part of it's kind of lazy because you're like, OK, well, everybody yeah. else agrees. with well, you. I don't have to. I don't want to go through another half an hour discussion. I'll just nod my head and we'll just move forward with that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that causes like um, a lot of tension after the meeting or, or yeah, resentment you know, like, and resent, yeah. yeah, it's like, why, you know, why is he, do, oh, did you speak up? No, of course not. I don't <laughs> want the meeting to last, you know, you know, another hour or, you know, <laughs> but I've been kind of consciously, um, you know, and, and not in, in a very respectful way, not a, yeah. but like disagreeing with, with ideas mm -hmm. or, or bringing up alternatives that, you know, or or just challenging things you know mm -hmm. i think that's super helpful it kind of um elevates things instead of yeah. like let letting things just be status quo you know yeah. it's like okay um well he said and, it, and we think, all agree yeah. yeah i think the listening to learn i you know as a way to do that ask questions to kind of understand it Absolutely. now there may be disagreement yeah. even beyond that but i think that's a helpful kind of path. yes it's definitely a starting point absolutely yeah yeah um, so all of this, she says on 63, all of this means that we withhold contradictory data so necessary to finding a good solution in complexity. We drive disagreement underground, which is what you're describing. Mm -hmm. um, folks around here are trying so hard to be nice to each other that they're not willing to be honest about anything anymore. And that's the other thing is you kind of have to choose to be, I think there's a famous book out there um, called uh, like The Courage to be Disliked. I can't remember the author's name, but um, but that's, I just recently, a friend is reading it and she told me about it. So, you know, that's, that's part of this is you kind of, you got to be willing to sort of shuffle some feathers, um, even when it's not comfortable to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, part of it is like, um, what, what helped me a lot was like, um, kind of getting rid of the feeling of insecurity, like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, you know, or, or the, um, um, it's hard to express, like the feeling that, okay, well, if something happens, um, if I say something wrong, then there's going to be a severe neg negative consequence. Yeah. Like for me, I've just kind of released that. I'm like, okay, well, you know what, we're, we're in an uncertain world. World. yeah like, it's almost what? you almost have a little bit more permission to practice it is that what you mean yeah i yeah. think so I, a little yeah. bit more open like okay well you know if the company tanks or or if i get laid off i'm i get laid off 
Yeah. But I might as well try to make things better and mm -hmm. not just agree with every policy or every meeting or every concept, you know, and yeah, you know, uh, kind of challenge some things and try to make uh, things operate differently, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's yeah, and that's interesting because, you know, in the next section, she on 65 um, talks about compromise. So we believe that our disagreement yeah. should be fixed with compromise. But while compromise might feel fair in complex situations, it's often the wrong way to go because compromise tends to merge two options into one. In complexity, having more options is always better because you can't possibly know beforehand which option will actually pay off. So the urge to compromise in complexity takes you from two viable options to one potentially mediocre one. And that's kind of how yeah. I feel going back to the, the economy versus the virus uh, approaches and that the two approaches between England and America. Um, when that happened was essentially if you try and do both it, you're going to get the worst economic and the worst viral right. um, response so you got to pick one but perhaps there's actually a third option that that actually benefits both and minimizes the consequences of both as well and i think that's the idea of not compromising is that we want to find that option yeah absolutely um yeah you know a lot of times um we think that um, compromise is a good thing mm -hmm. um, when, you know, it's really can, can be detrimental to both parties. It's like a lose, lose. Yes. Yeah, both sides. Get both sides. Yeah. <laughs> Better so at once. There's, yeah. There's a book that, um, that I read recently um, it's called uh, never split the difference. Yeah. I have um, it on my list. Tell me about it. Uh, yeah, it's it's by this um, hostage negotiator, uh, Christopher Voss, um, yeah. very famous hostage negotiator, and his view on compromise is it is absolutely a lose lose situation. You know, yeah, you never want to compromise, and you don't compromise in a life or death hostage situation mm -hmm. either. Somebody ends up dying. You know, yeah, or it's like end. okay, I'll I'll take one. You you can kill one. I'll I'll take the other. Like that's right. a terrible thing. So. There's exactly. something about the values that transcend that compromise, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so absolutely, you know, I definitely recommend the book. I don't want to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. do it injustice by summarizing it, but uh, definitely recommend. It's very interesting on uh, yeah. negotiating tips. and. Uh, yeah, and she talks, so um, then she talks about how when we cannot compromise, if we don't seek that that third way we polarize. Yeah. we polarize and that is exactly what i see is happening is the polarization yes. is curving and not just in terms of politically but in terms of this pandemic and how we're polarized polarizing around approaches and it's getting it's getting messy it's yeah it's and um you know it you get so many different stories about how how different people are are reacting to mm -hmm. it like you know i, I heard a story or read a story this morning about um, somebody who um, who was able to secure the paycheck uh, protection oh, yeah. loan um, for their um, they had a series of uh, salons mm -hmm. and some of her employees were really upset with um, the owner for for getting that loan because it because they were making more money with unemployment and the stimulus pay. Oh, so now they were come back to, they'd have to come back and work and make less money. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. so, you know, how complex is that when, yeah. you know, when the, some things. The unintended know, consequences and how that unfolds and how it respond. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's like, you know, who's right and who's wrong in, in that situation. And like, how, you know, yeah. how do you wrestle with, with that, like, you know, a, a employer that's trying to do good for employees and employee. Mm -hmm wants to help their family yeah. out but the best and, way to help them you know and it, yeah it's both both of them are benefiting from the government package but the benefit is actually not in harmony it's in conflict and that's something yeah. the government needs to be considering is that they're not creating environments that's that, that's happening right that's what, right that they've done. maybe that's an exception and you have to deal with it or maybe that's the rule and we need to deal with that so yeah that's really interesting um the the consequences and you know, on that, you know, uh, back to the sort of how we respond to the virus approach is if people, like if I do social distance and I do sort of am cautious, 
but let's say somebody I know doesn't and they end up giving us the virus, like I'm having to deal with the consequences of their choices, even if I make the good, uh, what I think are the good ones. Right. right. So it's, it's complex because now we're interconnected in a very kind of hypersensitive real time kind of way that, that it was probably always there, but it wasn't as visible. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the impact wasn't as noticeable, you know, like, <laughs> Because before I might have given someone the flu, but no, no one would have ever known. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. It was just there. <laughs> it was just there, and we wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have associated with anything. Like, people just get the flu, you know? Yeah, it's just part of life. Like, you part know? of life, right? So, it may, you know, now yeah. it's a little bit. Now we see the connections. And I think it's, yeah. I think as humans, we're going to struggle with that type of um, hyper transparency because I think we can be kind of nasty to each other. And if we, if we could actually see who gave us things, you know, I think, I don't know, it's kind of a dangerous potential, but um, yeah. So the, the, let's talk about getting out of this. Uh, well, did you have anything else about um, track by agreement before I jump into the key question and have it? Um, well, one, one thing I wanted to just kind of note was, um, so on page 68, yeah. um, uh, you know, they're, they're going through the narrative and here's the quote, um, you know, she's talking to Mark, who's the, one of the main characters, you know, yeah. uh, she says, that's the thing Mark said, nodding. I think we have confused agreement with liking people or making them feel good. And I know I've been confusing disagreement with stuff that I need to fix or make go away. So mm. that whole, yeah, just because you disagree with something doesn't mean you don't like the person. Yeah. Um, or they, they can you know, be separate. Yeah. They can be totally separate, but but a lot of times we tie the two together. You know, we, yeah. we think, oh, they must hate me because they don't agree with mm -hmm. what I believe in, you know. Cause yeah, and what's interesting about that is uh, I just uh, watched the documentary The Rise of Jordan Peterson on Amazon. It's on there now. Oh, um, okay. And uh, and that that describes that is he was making, he was sort of asserting himself in certain ways and making certain statements and beliefs. But a lot of people that, um, that he was, that, that were affected by those comments, they took it as he hated them. He didn't like them. He was out against them. And, and that, and they completely missed the, the point. There was a disconnect between the two sides because um, they mm -hmm. were conflating what he was saying and doing with, essentially he didn't like them and he was against them. They, they, they made him the villain in, in their story. Um, so that was interesting to see. And, and from their point of view, you know, I could, I could see how they would feel that way. And that, yeah. that way. Um, it wasn't unreasonable in that sense. Um, but I think that's kind of why we have to sort of let this go and, and, and respond accordingly. So um, am I being uh, so is my video being uh it's a little choppy. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, okay. It's, I but, don't know if that's my camera or what, but uh, it looks like it just stopped. So yeah, it looks like <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's my internet. But anyways, um, yeah. So any 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 other thoughts before we jump into the key question and have um, that's the only one that I uh, yeah. immediately thought of. Mm -hmm. All right. So the key question for us is: Could this could this conflict serve to deepen a relationship? And yes, it can. And yeah. the some of the people I've had the most the worst conflicts with but that we worked through it it created the the deepest relationships but it was not easy and it was hard yeah. and and that's yeah. that's a challenge but i think we give up before we can see the fruit of that and we and and if we've never experienced that then we never actually see that um and i think this is an opportunity for our country and even the world to come together in ways that it never had before but i think we're probably going to fight a lot before we're going to get unified so i think yeah. you know the the marvel movies you know the cap this is captain america and iron man you know they they fought but then eventually they came together to, to fight the the collective villain so absolutely yeah i think it's gonna definitely be um a journey um um it kind of reminds me of like um so there's this guy that um uh he he was an african-american guy that befriended KKK members yeah and eventually through their friendship the KKK members you know kind of reformed and just kind yeah. of you know kind of understood where he was coming from and mm -hmm. 
he questioned his beliefs and challenged um yeah you know their way of thinking and then eventually through the friendship and it didn't take like it it wasn't something that happened overnight it, it was something time, that, yeah yeah that he invested a lot of time in and eventually they would come over to the other side but yeah, yeah totally. and i've heard many stories like that in terms of like um i there's a story of a guy who was in the kkk and he was put on a council with a black woman feminist uh in the i think it was the 60s um and they fought but then they they kind of understood that they were actually on the same side <laughs> same principles right yeah <laughs> and they ended up working together to fight fight the the more of the system systemic problems that they were facing so um because we we fall into you know a lot of people fall a lot of people it's interesting that whole idea of discipleship a lot of people get pulled into those things because someone comes alongside them and, and guides them and maybe uh, yeah. it's in the wrong direction i mean i've had unhealthy toxic mentors but when you don't have a mentor and that's all you got you go with what you got right so right um so i think we also got to recognize that that could be any of us you know we might look down yeah. at someone's in the kk and and go well that would never be me but if you think that then you don't you're already yeah. you don't know your potential for ill um we can we all assume we've got great potential for good but we don't often assume the other side so yeah absolutely something to definitely so be the the key habit here is disagree to expand so mm. how can we intentionally disagree when we're finding ourselves agreeing on something and um it doesn't always feel good but like you said earlier you end up with better better fruit um so let's shift to the next one um how are you uh are you good on time or i yeah. know we're kind of going a little longer than originally planned but um, i'm good on time <laughs> all right so good conversation yeah so let's talk about trapped by control trying to take tr charge strips you of influence or strips me of influence or you trying to take charge so um you know it's it's interesting that you know we want to have control and then by asserting that control, we can actually damage relationships and cause more problems than good. Uh, I, what do you What do you think about this this seduction of danger of control? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it's weird because the thing is, like, you don't like feeling out of control. Yeah, you know. Um, I don't think, I don't know of anybody that feels, you know, <laughs> yeah. likes being out of control, you know? Yeah. So it's, this one's uh, kind of difficult to kind of, <laughs> kind of grapple. Cause it's like, okay, there's like different degrees of control, I guess. But yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think on that point, she, she does make the comment. She says, it'd be fabulous if we could give up control of the less important things, like whether our kids brush their teeth for exactly three minutes as a mm. dentist recommends in exchange for controlling the more important things like whom they hang out with at lunch and whether they smoke pot behind the tool shed after school. So I think right. part of it is, okay, maybe there's going to be that tendency, but we're not even like consistent in it. We're, we're trying to control just this, the most frivolous things. So there's, yeah. there's a problem there in terms of priority. <laughs> there, there is, and, and kind of this, there's like this belief that, you know, uh, having some control over like something like insignificant, like kind of empowers us to, you know, yeah. like, you know, they might not even be important, but I, at least I have control, you know, yeah. over, over whatever that thing is. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. I think, you know, we're in a situation right now in the, in the crisis, um, uh, we are we the world is out of control in a way and our yeah. lives are out of control in a way and we try and assert that in different ways and and a lot of that can be unhelpful and um unfruitful and why it can be foolish um and it's it's but it's hard to not like take that emotional reaction and and, and try and reassert control in a, in a way that sort of makes us um content or happy and, and that's kind of the idea is that being in control is not critical to our success or happiness. It's not tied to that. In fact, it's yeah. our ability to let go is probably better. And so I'll give you an example. Last year, at the end of last year, I had a client that that um, unexplainably, we, it just, it went bad really fast. And I tried to reconcile it and I, and I couldn't. And I, you know, I try to hold on a little bit, but then I realized the best thing I can do is just to let it go. Um, and it was hard, but it, it sort of allowed me to sort of accept it and move on. 
without it continuing to harm me. And and, and the other side of it is I, I expect, I've been in business long enough, I've been freelancing long enough, I know stuff happens. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of expect it's going to happen. And so I live my life and I operate in a way that that allows me to let go. And I think that's a big thing that's helped me is, you know, if a, you know, if a client's not going to pay me or if a client's going to stop working with me, I'm, I don't have to hold on because of the financial piece, because I'm living in a financial way that allows me to let that go. And it doesn't mean my kids and me are going to starve um, because of it. You yeah. know? <laughs> right. That makes it a little easier because I know yeah. it's, really hard to do that so i'm just gonna at least stack the deck in my favor (laughs) right right you have the the choice you know some people feel trapped by you know those Mm -hmm. those things but you have a a choice to yeah walk away and and safe you know safely walk away and and we can all justify it you know my me and my family are starving so i'm going to steal this loaf of bread right we can all come up with a reason to justify those decisions um but we can also sort of, I think, make that decision before that happens, that when that happens, we can respond accordingly. And Absolutely. Um, you know, as it pertains to the this whole pandemic, I mean, like, you can tell people are longing for some sort of control, like, whether this is right or wrong, but, you know, the people that are protesting, you know, at yeah. the different capitals, yeah. um, you know, that's clearly an expression of people wanting to take back control or, or have mm-hmm. a sense of control over their lives. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, and it, I think in America, it kind of gets conflated with the, you know, our independence and our bill of rights and, and yeah. the constitution. And, but I, I think some of that's a mask for what's really going on. Um, and, and I think our rights are important and I think we need to navigate that through this situation wisely. Absolutely. But I do feel like a lot of that gets completed. I don't know if, uh, what you think about that. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think it, it 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 does. It's it's kind of used as an excuse to kind of like, okay, well, yeah, um, you know, <laughs> don't tread on me. I'm going to do what I want. Don't tell me what to do. Right. And I actually think that's being a, a big. I do think you know, in terms of the leadership, um, in terms of taking control, um, I. I, I don't know how best to have done this, but I will say I think a lot of people were locked in without buy-in. And yeah. so without buy-in, I feel like I'm being forced to do something I don't want to do or that I don't agree with. And if I'm skeptical, it's even more extreme, right? Wow. And yeah. so part of me is concerned that we're going to have to have a second wave to get the buy-in from the people that are not bought in to to the approach of social distancing and being cautious and, and the different things that, that play into that. Um, and so how could the, maybe there were things or are things the leadership, uh, you know, the president and, and states could do to help bring people along, but, um, but for whatever degree they, they haven't, and maybe they started too much control too quickly without enough to go with that, that they lost influence with a lot of these people. I like and, that. Yeah. Point. Go ahead. So, um, so this kind of reminds me of like a situation that uh, that we are kind of going through um, at work is, um, you know, uh, the topic of of having like a mandatory mm-hmm. weekly meeting. You know, yeah. Just to kind of like, oh, we need to get everybody together because, um, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. But you know, one approach is just to make it mandatory and just say, hey, everybody must attend. You must attend yeah. this meeting um, or else, mm-hmm. right? Um, the approach that we thought was a lot better, you know, instead of mandating it, make it optional. And then all, at the same time, like kind of approach it in a marketing way where, you know, you're providing value at this meeting. So people will want to come to this meeting as opposed yeah. to. Um, and and he, it could be a good thing, like yeah. what, what, the, what our government is doing could be the best thing for us, but it's, there's still something about bringing people along, um, even if it's the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to have that, that buy-in and, and kind of um, give people a choice, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or, at least, or at least some sort of say in, yeah. in the matter um, so that they don't feel like they're being told. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like it's like, their decision right <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah 
And, and that's, I think I'm kind of on the front edge of the knowledge train in terms of the situation. Like I'm reading the stuff as quick as it comes out and, and understanding it and different feedback. So I, I think for me, I, I have bought into it, right? Um, mm. And so, but I sort of made that choice and I was a part of that process. A lot of people are there, they're just reacting to what the governor tells them, what yes. the church tells them, what whatever. Um, and they're not necessarily doing that. And, you know, not everyone can do that. So, um, but yeah, influencers, we got a lot of responsibility right now. <laughs> um, yes. There's an interesting passage on 82 where he talks, where she talks about new CEOs. Uh, new CEOs are often most surprised, um, you know, just about this trap of control. Um, they've been waiting all their careers to have the ultimate control. And they discover often much to their shock, they feel less in less control than they did in the other positions. It's almost as if when we get to the top, there's nowhere we can look for someone more powerful who can actually control the thing. The CEOs finally have to stop believing the myth that somewhere, somewhere, someone is fully in charge and begin to believe in the myriad of forces that combine to create the future. And I think that's another thing is like people look at the president and all of a sudden it's like he did this or that. And I think he, he invites some of that. He's like, I did this or that, you know, right, and, right. Um, but we have to realize, and what I'm seeing, even, even as I watch in the press briefings and see reports and looks, this is a system and people have different parts of that, but a lot of this is really the system and there's a lot of problems in the system. Um, and there are a lot of players in the system, but, but I think the system, you kind of understand all the forces that are actually playing out here. And it's, it's yeah. a, a lot more under, it, it, kind of gives a different perspective to understand that, that the Trump is not just sort of telling every single person in the government to do this or that. He's just, he's a pawn in a larger um, yeah. cog and a larger wheel of, you know, what's happening. <laughs> All right. So trapped by control. Most of us feel like we don't have enough control over the things that are important to us. So we figure that we are either doing it wrong or that someone else has the real power around here. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this um, in terms of our current situation and just, it's applicable. I was doing some research on conspiracy theories. And one of the biggest things that people, why people buy into conspiracy theories is they feel out of control. So they adopt a conspiracy theory because it gives, for whatever reason, that gives them a sense of control or, or maybe, I don't, I don't know exactly how that understands, but it was kind of what came to mind when I, when I read that there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think people who, who kind of believe those things, like, you know, the knowledge of, the conspiracy kind of gives them power. Oh, okay. That's interesting. It. Knowledge yeah. is power. That's a good way to look yeah, at it. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, you know, and that kind of, in a sense, like can help them navigate through situations. Like if they know, oh, well, that's just that, you know, there's a conspiracy with the water, you know, I'm not yeah. going to drink that water. So yeah. I'm taking control over. Yeah. You know, Buy into a simple story. And, and honestly, yeah. this is the challenge I'm having. I don't know how you influence. There's a, a lot of people that are that are falling in these traps in the book. I think it kind of gives some insights, but I, I kind of want a follow up book. It's like, here's how to help people navigate the mind traps. Okay, there, here, this book's how you do it yourself, but here's how you help others, because there's people that are falling in these traps, and it's um, it's it's very hard. How do how do you help that person? Like in some of these cases, like you're describing. I, I don't know that there's anything you can really say or do that'll change their mind. I don't. Yeah. I, that's a great question. I don't, yeah. I don't know <laughs> how you would uh, approach that. You know, there's they, with someone that's like in a bought into conspiracy theory, maybe it's the rightness trap. I don't know, but it's almost like they, anything you throw at them like data wise or evidence, I feel like they're going to counter it something, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like the whole, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a whole, myriad of different conspiracies and there's probably a lot to unpack yeah with with those people um you know maybe there was a life altering event that happened or yeah or something you know that's at least that's how i how i view it like i find them interesting uh yeah <laughs> so some of them like wow how did you come to that conclusion okay yeah and it's <laughs> not that there's never been a conspiracy because you know like you learn about government secrets and yeah stuff. There, there's there's a, there. but it's it's yeah. You know, I think it, it's, again, again, you test everything, you figure out the evidence and you go where the truth yeah. leads you. 
Um, but I think some people sort of take that um, in, in weird directions that I think are, I don't know, they're, they're deceptive in a lot of ways, so. Yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I think your, your hint about like their key experiences, I, I do think there may be something in their life and maybe it's understanding them and their story um, that could help, you know, help them. But I, I think that's one of the interesting things that I find about, you know, people that are real cynical or skeptical in, in, the, in that type of, in, into that kind of conspiracy layers is they're kind of, I feel like they're so focused on a particular thing that they're against and that they're guarding. Like it's like protecting the front door and then the burglar gets in the back door, you know, like they yeah. get deceived because they're so not wanting to get deceived by this thing, you know, <laughs> like, um, and I think part of it maybe is kind of what we talked about earlier. They're not um, willing to accept that they could be just as wrong as those that they think are wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, definitely the the rightness comes into play. Like, yeah, um, and overly and, optimistic of themselves and their own beliefs and their own abilities and their own right. research. And, <laughs> and yeah, like yeah, like yeah. Uh, I, I loved. Uh, have you seen the movie Prometheus, the prequel to Alien? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I love that film. Um, it's a very divisive film. Um, but what I loved about it, so the the main character, she's you know she's one of faith, a kind of Christian. She has a cross. And, and they get mm -hmm. to this place and they're, they're thinking they're going to meet their maker. Right. Right. And they get there and it is, it's like hell and death. And she's like, this is not what we thought we have to get out of here. This is really bad. And, and just sort of this, this reconciliation that she was so wrong. And I think she says, and I think it's even in the trailer, we were wrong. We were so wrong. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and so she's trying to get out there and, and then everyone else is like, no, we got to figure out you know, and then everything goes crazy. But yeah. that was the thing that kind of resonated with me. She, she pursued this thing that she thought was good and then she realized how wrong she was. Mm. And I think we all have to get to that place because um, we, can, we can go to some pretty, pretty, pretty dark places. Absolutely, yeah. Um. Um, so she, uh, so we, let's talk about... Um, control um the key habit and the key question mm -hmm. the key question is what can i what can i help enable or what would enable me so i do have control over something um you know i remember probably 10 years ago i met a friend of mine he wrote a book about these fishermen that survived at sea three of them survived two of them died they were at sea for nine months um i asked him why did three die and or why did three live and two died and the three that lived um they did what they could they enabled each other and they did what they could control. And the two that died, they waited for rescue and they didn't do the hard things they needed to do. And, um, and I realized in my own business, I was waiting for rescue. I was waiting for the right person to hire the right product or the right service or the right tool or the right whatever. And none of those were going to save me, but I could. And so when I think about this, you know, how can I enable someone else or what can they do to enable me? Um, you know, that's what comes to mind. Um, so what can I do to enable someone? What can they do to enable me? And it's so empowering to just have that question um, from what I've found when I feel like I'm stuck. Yeah. I feel like I can't, I'm out of control. And that's kind of why I'm doing this inner, you know, this discussion and why I've been doing interviews. It's like, okay, this is something I can do that can help others. So Absolutely. I'm going to do it. Um, and it's maybe not a big thing, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a big thing in a small way. So yeah, and and it's kind of better than just kind of sitting and and consuming all the yeah. news and information. And yeah, it's just like, okay. something productive. <laughs> right, absolutely. I that's that's pretty awesome that you're doing this. Um, um, any other thoughts on that before we jump to the key habit? Um, no, I don't. I don't have any other. Okay. Other major thoughts, yeah. So the key habit, and this is another good thing, experiment at the edges. We can't yeah. change the core of what's happening, but we can do things, and now we can experiment, have a little bit of permission to do so, um, in ways that we wouldn't have been able to before. And um, maybe it's doing something like a video or an interview or a podcast or a new product or a new service. I know your company's doing some some new products that you wouldn't ever have done before, yeah. but you know now it's the time to experiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's Absolutely. something that we can control and it's something that if 
you know, it can become a, a game changer. You know, I imagine Zoom was an experiment at some point. Now it's everyone is using Zoom, you know, right. and, and it and it escalated to a whole nother degree with this crisis. So um, Google and, you know, social media, I mean, a lot of these big things that are just normal to us, they, a lot of them, I, I don't know specifically, but I know some of them were like experiments of companies and they just took off. Right. Yeah. It became their their flagship products. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, some, sometimes it's, it's hard to see the opportunity when you're in such like a chaotic or yeah. Uh, yeah. situation, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, <laughs> I'm worried about not getting sick, but Hey, it, you know, one thing that I, that I kind of um, brought up to the leadership team at, at work was like, Hey, this is an opportunity to like, kind of reconnect with your family um, kind of figure out the best way you can communicate with other people um, when they're working dispersed, you know, so there's a lot of other opportunities here that, that we can kind of capitalize on, you know, even in our personal and our, you know, work lives as well. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Well, let's jump into the last trap before we talk about the ladder. So the last trap is trapped by ego. Hmm. shackled to who you are now you can't reach for who you'll be next trapped by ego um the strongest trap is created by the person we are wanting to seem to be to ourselves and to others um we explore our belief that we have changed in the past but now we have arrived and won't change much in the future and i can definitely relate yeah. to that like um, like I changed a lot, gone through a lot, and then it's like, okay, I'm kind of done changing. You reached but, the peak, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like every every like age that I look back at when I was, you know, so how um I'll be uh how old am I? I'll be 36 this year. So when I was 30, when I was 25, when I was 20, like I I I look back at those and look now. I'm like, I'm glad I'm where I am at. Right. I don't look at any of them and go, I wish I was back. I, I mean, there may be some circumstances I. I enjoy but but in terms of yeah. who I was as a person and um but yet we kind of think we've arrived it's an interesting dynamic <laughs> yeah yeah this was uh this was very interesting and you know when I first read this chapter I was I was more thinking like um ego in sense in the sense of you know you know you being better than oh, okay like an elitism else. kind yeah, of elitism yeah. but it's really not that at all it's like the belief it's 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 a limiting belief that you are who you are and you, you don't you're not going to change you know yeah. like you arrive to a certain destination and and that's it like mm -hmm. okay that's but uh, you know she challenges that and says you know wait a minute like you're constantly changing and you know even it, when you say hey you know like oh man my you know the next 10 years are going to be like, you know, the craziest <laughs> years. And then you get to the next 10 years and you say the exact same thing. And yeah. Uh, I and, found and that think, interesting. Yeah. I mean, think about this crisis, like what a waste it would be in a year if you were the same person. Yeah. Like yeah. to waste that opportunity to change and to transform them. Some, some better leader, some better father, some better husband, you know, or, or wife if you're, you're on their side. So absolutely yeah definitely a huge opportunity yeah um but yeah ego is uh is very interesting like yeah you know like i i myself like um have caught myself kind of trapped in like oh man you know that's i can't do that you know because you know i'm not good at that you know? yeah and I, I don't question yeah. it at all you know it's like okay yeah. well, have but we try it? like yeah current version of you might not be good at it but future version of you could yeah be. yeah absolutely if i if i really invested time and effort into it then yeah maybe i can do that but um uh, you know i sometimes it's easier to dismiss something you know because you don't want to put the effort into it or you you know you think it's impossible you yeah. Know? yeah yeah so. yeah yeah it's interesting so on at 98 she says um, most people are spending time and energy covering up their weaknesses managing other people's impressions of them showing themselves to their best advantage, playing politics, hiding their inadequacies, hiding their uncertainties, hiding their limitations, hiding, 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 hiding. Yeah, right. I, uh, I, when I read that at first, uh, I thought of the story of Adam and Eve. And oh, I never yeah. thought of it as an ego thing, but 
but it was interesting to kind of read that and go that's they they sinned they did what they weren't supposed to and then they covered themselves and they went ahead and god's essentially where are you adam and he's you know <laughs> hiding in the trees <laughs> in, under fig yeah. leaves and so that whole idea of hiding 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 it's interesting yeah it's always been with us that's wild yeah yeah <laughs> i've never thought of that yeah i could you know if, um, if you have children you kind of see that yeah as well you know when when they're, when they're doing <laughs> something they're ashamed of or or you know like trying to hide something and you like you know they did something wrong yeah and they're trying their best to you know hide yeah. whatever thing they did you know spilling milk or something mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and like, i th yeah i think the what i found to be the best indicator to see pride in myself or in others is self-justification mm. and so when I, when and I, I might, you know, virtuously defend myself, but I think a lot of that's ego. And when I, the example that I think is inspiring to me is the story of Jesus when he's being tried um, for crimes he did not commit. He did not defend himself and he had yeah. every right to. And I think when we're, you know, if you have, if you've ever been in a situation where someone's talking about you in a negative way or incorrectly, our, our inclination is to defend ourselves, right? And it's yeah. an interesting exercise to bite your tongue in those scenarios, to not say anything. And um, in terms of if you want to address the ego thing, so I've, I've done that before, like as a practice to see, okay, someone says something about me that's not true, or it's maybe partially true, and I feel like I need to explain it. Explain, yeah. I'm just not going to say anything. I'm Same just going to let people be mis misperceived about me. And if I can do that, like, I think that's the test. That's at least what I've <laughs> experimented yeah. with. Yeah. I need to try that out. I, I haven't <laughs> thought about that approach. Yeah. And I, th I actually think that's a, one of the things with Trump that he suffers from. Oh, man. Yeah. He cannot. He just needs not... to let people misperceive him if that's what he needs to do. Yeah. And he cannot do this. So I, I mm. kind of think of him as someone with a lot of ego. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So maybe, maybe he'll have an opportunity to change through this situation like all of us. Um, so, uh, let's see, what else you got for, um, ego? Well, I definitely highlighted that, um, quote that you just said about hiding. Um, yeah. Um, let me see what else we have. Um, 102, she talks about, um, uh, the idea of self-authored form of mind, because now we do not want to be written by our circumstances. We want to figure out how to pick up the pen and write our own story. So I've got another book um, that you actually recommended here called How the Mighty Fall. And at the back of it, it says, whether you prevail or fail, endure or die, depends more on what you do to yourself than on what the world does to you. And it's by Jim Collins. And, um, and it's interesting, like, you know, we, we are sort of a ship in a, in a sea that, that we cannot control, but we do have a boat that we're in yeah. and there are things we can do. And I think there's something about sort of deciding, you know what, this is the type of sailor I'm going to be. This is the type of person I'm going to be. And this is how I'm going to respond to things. And this is how I'm going to live. Absolutely. Yeah. Just um, kind of, you know, the one thing that you're absolutely in control of is, is yourself. You know, you're not like those around you, even your, you know, your children, you're not fully in control. Yeah, as much them, as we you know? might hope, but yeah. <laughs> however they get, it seems like the less that's true. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I totally agree with that. Like, like just um, understanding that it's okay not to be in control of other people or things or situations, but, you know, you can control how you react to those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, you can control your feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we what, respond, yeah. Yeah, how you respond, yeah. And how we and, process them, and yeah. And and that's been super helpful, like um, in in kind of kind of tempering a lot of anxiety that that I've had, mm -hmm. like you know, especially in this situation. I, I don't think I've met a person that has been fully like, oh yeah, yeah, COVID. It's I, I'm totally fine. Like there, are, you know, everybody's concerned yeah. about something. So yeah, and um, some people are sort of resisting it. Others are leaning into it. Um, yeah. Kind of think of the legend of the of the bulls and the cows. Have you heard that with the clouds and the storm? So the, the idea is that the storm's coming, the bulls, they charge the storm so that they, oh, they yes. are under the, the clouds for less time. The cows run away from it, so they're under it more. And, right. um, 
And so uh, it's just, you know, we, we have to go through the storm. So how, which one, which approach do we want to, do we want to go with? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, 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 our pastor, Andy Stanley, did a sermon this weekend and he talked about uh, Admiral Jim Stockdale. And uh, he's got a quote where he says, um, uh, the Stockdale says, I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into a defining event in my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. And I think the idea with, with the ego trap or the ego trap is that we spend more time defending who we are than allowing life to transform us, allowing these opportunities to lean in and go, okay, this is happening. How can this be used for something greater than me or a greater version of me? Absolutely. Yeah. It, and I think part of that is like just, um, you know, kind of being okay with uh, insecurity. Like mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of this ego stuff is due to insecurities. Like that point, yeah. you know, I have to justify who I am and what I am mm -hmm. because, because of uh, some reason, yeah, some reason. Yeah, some reason or like just to kind of, you know, like defend your actions, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, and that's a good, that's interesting because I think to help someone with ego does require accepting them for who they are. Yeah. And if someone doesn't have that, it, it may be hard, it's probably harder, if not impossible, to overcome that ego if, if they don't have a safe place to, to be accepted in the midst of those insecurities. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, it, it could go the complete opposite direction and they, they double down on like you know those those ego related behaviors like you know, yeah be even more tied to mm -hmm. making that tied to their identity like that is who i am and yeah you know, yeah so yeah that's good uh anything else before we jump to the key question and the habit for this one no i mean it's uh so one other thing that i highlighted was um on 108 when she says uh you know notice the difference between i'm just not that person who is inspiring mm -hmm. at the front of the room versus and up until now and then i just have have up until now i just haven't been that person who is inspiring in front of the room so the the difference in in saying you know you know one is like kind of very affirmative like stuck in place like mm -hmm. versus, I'm, I'm essentially justifying why i shouldn't change right yeah, absolutely. And then when when you when you use a modifier like up until now or yeah, um, you and know, isn't in it the interesting future. that our language shapes so much of that? Yeah, yeah. It is. It's very very interesting. Like the how you say something, even though it's you're saying the same thing essentially, yeah. but yeah. but the approach that you're taking kind of changes yeah. the meaning altogether. Because you know. I think even if you weren't ready to be that person, I think if you started talking that way, you would start to shift. Yeah, yeah. That's why I think a lot of people, um, like they do uh, positive affirmations, you know, they, um, as part of like a daily routine or ritual, which, which basically kind of reinforces um, yeah. some of those ideas of, Mm -hmm. of using language and, and reinforcing those ideas in your head so that your yeah. mind starts kind of changing. Yeah. And that, when I did the Dale Carnegie course, that's, that's how it was. It was, I am, if I'm not a person of courage, we would talk about it as if I, I am a person of courage. I am a mm. person of courage. I am a person of courage. And it was sort of talking in the past tense or in the present tense um, about something that may not necessarily be true yet today. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's good. So that kind of the key, um, the key question under that is, you know, who do I want to be next? What does, what is hmm. it that, that that looks like? And to write it down and to, to articulate that and, and to eventually share that with others. Um, I am who I am. And so I'm going to write who I want to be. And, and I'm going to move towards that. And it may take time and sometimes I may feel like I'm going backwards instead of forward. <laughs> But yeah. um, I'm working through that process, and I think something to aim for is is a is a critical part of that. And I think that vocabulary is is underlying that type of thing. Gar uh, Garvey Berger uses this term I found really interesting called a growth edge. Okay. Um, and she says um, 
uh, a growth edge is the place that might mark out the territory of the person in, in this case she'll be next or he'll be next mm. so something to hold on to or aim for is that kind of what she's saying yeah it's more like um so um let me read the whole passage just so yeah. you can get some some context so so you get uh you get the idea by asking questions and listening to herself she can find out what's really shaping her thinking and she and she can begin to find her own growth edge the place that might mark out the territory uh, mm. of the person she'll be next so yeah um just kind of you know asking questions and kind of questioning like um you know am i really like this or or am i really limited by this yeah um, then she'll find out like where she can head where yeah head like what's possible like mm -hmm. um which is i think is really important to kind of kind of get out of this this ego mind trap is trying to find out um what's the next step in my growth yeah eventually. yeah yeah i like that so that's that's you know in terms of listening we talk about listening to learn from others and listening to learn from yourself is, is part of that is understanding you know who is it that i want to be um and 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 what are the steps you can take to move that? I think um, for for that growth, one of the two things that have been helpful for me, reflecting on the past and learning the lessons, sort of cultivating the lessons from past experiences, and then looking to the future to define what it is I want that future to look like, yeah. what I want to look like, what I want my situation to look like. Um, but you know, I can I can have some things I aspire for, but but ultimately I can only control how I'm going to respond. So. So those are those are kind of strategies that we can help. So I guess to kind of recap the five traps, and then we'll talk a little bit about the latter. Um, the first, the five traps. You know, the first was our desire for a simple story blinds us to the real one. The key question is how is this person a hero? The key habit is carry three different stories. The second mind trap is just because it feels right doesn't mean it is right. What do I believe, and how could I be wrong? Is the key question. And then the key habit is listen to learn rather than listening to win or listening to fix. The third mind trap was looking for agreement robs us of good ideas. The key question is, could this conflict serve to deepen a relationship? And the key habit is disagree to expand the solution sets rather than agreeing to contract it. The fourth mind trap, taking control, strips us of influence. And the key question is, what can I help enable and what can help enable me instead of taking control? <laughs> and then experiment at the edges where I can. And then the last is shackled by our ego to who we are now, we can't reach for who will be next. And so the key question is, who do I want to be next? And the key habit is listening to learn from ourselves. So anything on that before we jump to uh, the ladder? So the ladder, um, we'll kind of just quickly survey the four aspects of a ladder. So the, the ladder is this thing that transcends the traps. And, and while those, while there are key questions, key habits to help us navigate those, the latter actually helps us um, at a higher level. And so there's four areas, connect to purpose, um, connect to our body, um, connect to our emotions, and connect to compassion for ourselves and for others. So let's talk a little bit about purpose first. Um, Perhaps, and she says this on, uh, on page 117 around purpose, perhaps the most important rule for escaping the traps while not getting blown off course is to connect to a deep purpose and live from that or towards that. So we get so busy with the details that we forget to keep looking for the larger purpose of our lives. Without that larger purpose, we will struggle to find the keel that keeps us steady in the howling winds of change. And it turns out without the larger purpose, our lives are not only less meaningful, but shorter too. She talks about some of the research that says without a purpose, people actually live shorter. Live less, yeah, yeah. Less, less longer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what do you think yeah, about this? Yeah, I, I, I found that it very interesting. Like, and but it makes it makes sense um, in, in my point of view. Like, you know, you read about people who uh, who are so tied with their um, employment, their job, their career that mm -hmm. when they retire a lot of them pass away because they, they lose mm -hmm. that sense of purpose. Yeah, you know? they get sick and, uh, yeah. They, yeah, and it's and there, there's been studies that, that show that, you know, that direct correlation, um, yeah. which is kind of, it's really interesting. And, you know, the other aspect that was interesting is that the, it, 
purpose is a pursuit or a purpose as a pursuit. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just like a single defining thing. It's something that's that you're constantly going after. It's not attainable, you know, or yeah. it shouldn't be attainable. Yeah. Uh, or fully attainable. It can be partially attainable or um, when you reach a milestone, then you have another milestone to, mm -hmm. to hit when you're. Yeah. It's, I kind of think of it. Yeah. Something to sustain. I mean, my purpose statement is to embrace the life of Jesus. So that's something that if I fail at everything else, but I can do that, then I, then mm -hmm. I've succeeded, you know, and I can live from and, and for that. And, um, and that's the life he lived and the life he gave, um, and his example. And, and then my mission is to share that life. So that life that I've received that, that I would share that with others. So that, that drives me and, um, and it transcends any circumstance. It transcends any success or failure. It transcends me falling into the, any of these traps or any of these insecurities. I can rest in that. And, and I think that helps me navigate some of these mind traps that would be, I would be more susceptible to, or, or I was more susceptible to when I was younger. Um, it helps me to overcome that. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, and it's kind of like, to me, it's like kind of having like a, like a lighthouse almost yeah. to, to kind of, okay, kind of mm -hmm. direct you. Um, yeah. You know, it can be so far. Yeah. <laughs> when the storms come, it's yeah. that it's a foundation that's going and the the severity of the storm is also going to determine how grounded that purpose really is absolutely and uh we're both you know fans of simon sinek he talks about start with why which is very similar you know start with yeah. that purpose and um and and that's our starting point you know that's why am i here why am i getting out of bed why am i working why am i helping others why am i enduring this crisis i mean some people don't have answers to those questions and it's going to be very challenging without without this absolutely yeah um yeah that's something you know honestly i'm i'm working on as well like um just defining it um you know i think i have an idea of what what my personal purpose is yeah um but i haven't fully like fleshed it out um, yeah like articulated it it's kind yeah, of art more intuitive yeah it, it's it's in you know it it involves like different elements like family you know, yeah. making sure that you know and leaving a legacy and you yeah. know, making sure that i'm not you know i'm leaving the world a better place than it than yeah when i saw it yeah. so you know things like that like uh but i haven't like something that i i would love to work on during this time is to kind of nail that down, like nail mm -hmm. that. Um, what exactly am I? Yeah, and that's, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a good thing to, um, to help in terms of self authoring to go through that process to go, this is, this is my, I'm going to be intentional about this. Um, and she says on page 120, which is interesting in that, in that line, coming to terms with our mortality makes each day a little more precious and makes it more urgent for us to do something meaningful with the blink of time we have on this planet. And I think this crisis is bringing that truth to the surface to a large amount of people very quickly. Like we are all mortal and none of us really know how we're going to fare and how this unfolds. Absolutely. So let's make the yeah. best of whatever time that is that we do have. Yes. So the next is connecting to our bodies. Keep us grounded in what is rather than allowing the mind traps to um, to trap us with what might or should be. So we're really trying to be sensitive to what's happening. So there's a little story here I'll read from Nabil. Nabil was trying to show up better in meetings, be less visibly impatient and annoyed. At first, his goal was to disguise the feelings he knew were inevitable. But when he realized that he was fail falling into some classic mind traps that were causing some of those feelings, his desire to control the outcome of a discussion was fighting with his desire for all his team members to get along with each other. As those two mind traps battled within him, he became frustrated, not just with the others, but he realized with himself. Beginning to pay attention to his body left him with new ways to escape those mind traps altogether. He noticed that the emotions of impatience and annoyance was accompanied by the sensation of a tight chest and a racing heart. He recognized those as symptoms of anxiety as much of his annoyance and was able to remember why he was anxious. He saw the traps. The mind trap of control was escalating his fear that the group would not make a decision and that he, as the CEO, would be held responsible for that. The mind trap of agreement was making him hold his tongue because he didn't want to cause strife in the group. 
that led him in uncomfortable circles. No wonder he was so impatient and annoyed. He started to simply name his underlying concerns at a meeting. Hey, I'm noticing that we're circling this topic and it might be the rest of you are finding we're progressing, but I'm a little bit nervous that we're not getting very far. And he pushed against his need for harmony by reminding them and himself that productive disagreement might be a help. I'm wondering whether there are things that we aren't saying that might be getting in the way. And there's a little bit more, but essentially this idea that we say what we're feeling, we, what's happening. We just, it's almost like real time um, commentation of, of my body, you know, <laughs> like yeah. in, you know, I'm feeling frustrated or whatever. We just, we just say it. And so it doesn't bottle up. Uh, that's something that, you know, I relate to a lot. Yeah, and this whole connection, like you, it's, um, for me, it, like, I always thought there was like a distinction between, you know, the body and, and you know, emotions or, or, or yeah. thoughts, you know, and they're very interconnected, and I think mm -hmm. that's what. Um, yeah, yeah, and so she, she talks about the next one being connecting to emotions, and the thing that, um, she says this, and I could relate because I, I experienced this when I went through, when I shut down my business and I went through panic attacks and anxiety and depression and all that in a severe level. This is one of the things I learned through that process was um, people who can name their emotions in nuanced ways, I'm anxious about this job interview, but also excited and energized, have surprisingly better outcomes in a wide variety of places than those who lump everything together. I'm super nervous about the job interview. It turns out that people who name emotions, emotional nuance are better able to recover from setbacks, can better manage their anxiety and sadness, and generally cope better with the unexpected difficulties of life. Mm. And so what was interesting is just, you know, this idea of sort of untangling my emotions and labeling them when I was going through all that. I actually started to understand what is anxiety, what's stress, what's depression, what's it was interesting because all of it was just sort of this emotional cloud that was there. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I was getting to sort of sort them out, which then allowed me to sort of talk through them or does today in a more precise way to kind of pinpoint what's happening, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. There's absolute power in, in naming things. Um, yeah. And yeah, I can definitely relate to that as well. Um, just and, kind of and accepting both negative and, and the positive. It's not necessarily yeah. you know, happy, joyful versus sad, angry, whatever it might be. Uh, I, I think, think inside, the movie Inside Out is a great kind of way to sort oh, of think yeah. through that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and just knowing that, you know, it's, you know, when we talked earlier about, you know, the unknown or uncertainty, like when you identify or name something, then, then you know what it is and then mm -hmm. you can deal with it. Whereas when it's unknown, or you don't know what's causing it. So it's like, it just kind of spirals. Yeah. Um, and then it just gets worse and worse. In a way. Yep. Um, so the last, the last part of the ladder is connecting with compassion for both ourselves and others. And on 128, she says, if we hold these quirks, it's faults in ourselves or others we will be massively frustrated. Frustration and learning don't go together well, and we'll get in the way of our even noticing that we have fallen into the traps, much less escaping from them. If we see them as core and often helpful part of our humanity, we face it one another with compassion. Mm -hmm. Our ability to look at our own flaws with forgiveness and kindness is associated with emotional well-being, motivation, healthy behaviors, personal responsibility, coping, and better interpersonal relationships. It's, we're all in this together. We're all struggling. We're all, you know, working through it. Yeah. And uh, if we recognize that and and understand that and, and have compassion. You mentioned empathy earlier. Man, it just, I think we can be more encouraged than, than um, disappointed. I don't know, what do you think? I think so, I think so. And I think this is, this is a, one of those core biblical principles too. Um, yeah. Even, you know, when you say, uh, when, when the Bible says, you know, love your neighbor as yeah. yourself, but it implies that you yourself are compassionate to yourself, right? Like you're, yeah. you love yourself. So you want to love your neighbor just as much, you mm -hmm. know, but you first have to recognize and, and um, have compassion, you know, for yourself. And then you can use that to have compassion for others. Yeah. Here, any, any final thoughts as we wrap up this conversation here? 
I think this, you know, I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on uh, well, let me frame it in a different way. I don't know if my 20 year old self would appreciate or understand this book um, as much as I do now that I'm, you know, close to 37. If that Does that make any sense? Like, well, do you recommend? I, yeah, I think um, what I would say, I think, because, you know, when I think about it, I think we can teach our kids, teach, um, teach others them in a, in a more of a nuance or subtle way, you know, like, but it's, it's not like I'm, my kids are going to read the book. Right. But I think I could teach right. them these things. Like, you know, I'm not always right. And I, I need to acknowledge that and, and model it for them. Right. And, and them too, and, and work that out together. Um, I think, um, so I think we can raise them. I think the way that we raise our kids can be helpful. Um, I think it's, I'm trying to think of like the 20 year old, you know, 20, someone in their twenties. I don't know. It's, I think it'd be challenging to, to yeah. kind of convince them of these things. Um, I think the best way would probably be uh, to, to look at somebody else, uh, like their parents, you know, talk about like rightness, right. And then talk about it with their parents. I'm sure they would be all over it in the terms of like, Oh, their parents always think they're right. And they're never on. Blah, 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 blah. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And they wouldn't see it themselves. Yeah. But I think if you started there, then you could go, well, you know, you're, you can do that same thing as well. And so, um, so that's one way that comes to mind. Um, but I think there's a part of it that's like, well, you know, how, how fruitful is this really? Like, um, you know, like, what am I getting out of it? And I think, you know, some of it may be, there may be an aspect of these practices that are sacrificing the short-term win for a medium or a long-term. So yeah. if you're really oriented towards short-term benefits, you might not be as inclined. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely a lot um, you know, I've read other leadership books and mm -hmm. they're more like, okay, this is what you can do now quick. And yeah. like, they're very prescriptive, like, okay, do this and this and this, this is more, you know, it's a more of a questioning, more of a dialogue within yourself as yeah. well. Like, okay, you know, you know, am I following, falling into this trap? Okay. I am falling into this trap. What can I do to mitigate that what can mm -hmm. i do to recognize this trap when it when it happens again you know it's a lot more introspective i think mm -hmm. than yeah uh, and i and others. when you say that it also makes me realize that i think we have to experience the downsides and the consequences of falling into the traps enough mm. that we want to get out of them <laughs> or prevent yeah. them and when you don't have it i think it's it's less uh challenging to navigate or more, Absolutely. more challenging. Yeah. Absolutely. Or um, for me, like, uh, you know, you know, just being transparent, uh, you know, Jason, you, you helped our company uh, with some talent development and, yeah. you know, I was using some of this to kind of, um, I guess, justify what I saw in other, some others. Like to point it at them versus yeah, yourself. Yeah. And then I realized, wait a minute, like <laughs> this definitely applies to me. Mm. as much as as who i'm trying to say hey you're falling into this mind trap yeah well i'm following yeah following <laughs> yeah you know? and there is something to having a common language to, to, to share that yeah um and, and maybe you're what you're describing is the first step maybe you kind of have to see it in others before you see it in yourself yeah. <laughs> i mean it could be and you know like it's it's funny that like this did have an impact on on our culture for a good while like we uh we would say oh you know yeah that's that's a simple story or, Oh, oh hey, yeah. are we, you know, well, and it's interesting you say that because, um, I, what I just said, um, uh, about seeing it in others where you see it in yourself, I, probably 10 years ago. Yeah. Probably about 10, maybe 11 or nine between nine and 10, 11 years ago. Um, I started learning about my family history, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles. 
and I started to see patterns in them. And I saw the two, the two that I saw, the two traps I saw was control and agreement. And I saw it in them. And as soon as I saw it in them, I saw it in myself. Yeah. It was, it was interesting, but I had to see it in them first in that season of my life. Um, so I, I, that, I, I think that point about like, maybe that is a step in the process. Is, is, maybe there's something to that. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting, but it's always easier to, you know, blame someone else, point the finger, right? So that's right. why it's easier. Because, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then if we can kind of point that back at us and go, okay, maybe that could be me too. Um, and it's a hard thing to, to swallow. And I think it that's is. where my purpose and my faith, and, and you would probably agree, is that transcends it to go, okay, I'm following the model of Christ. I'm to be humble. I don't want to be humble, but I'm going to at least wrestle with that. <laughs> right, right, right. Your tendencies, yeah, yeah, definitely not. But yeah, definitely um, acknowledging that, yeah, we definitely need to be be humble. And that's how you grow, you know. Yeah. Uh, so definitely love this book. It, it just, it's very, I've never read a book that challenged me as much, mm -hmm. you know, challenged my way of thinking without like, um, uh, I guess kind of going against my thinking like yeah. in a direct way. It's yeah. not attacking me. Like I didn't feel attacked when I read yeah. this, you know, it was more like, wait a minute. Like I do these things and, yeah. and it's like, uh, I'm attacking myself because yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, Hey, yeah. Like, you know, well, I, you? Yeah. I, I'm glad that, that you feel that way and that you've gone through that way. Cause mm -hmm. you know, I brought it to you and, and the company cause I, I really, I resonated with me and it's, you know, I love to share things that, that matter to me and make an impact. And, and uh, it's a small little book. So if you want to, you know, anyone wants to read it, it's, it's quick read um, and pretty digestible. I was a little skeptical of the, the narrative piece, but that actually kind of worked out uh, more than I, than I initially uh, felt like it would. So. Yeah. I like, I like the narrative. I like that she used both a narrative and a kind of more of mm -hmm. a, just to give those um, examples and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. A, a kind of a real, real life example that you could kind of picture, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to just kind yeah. of. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little too real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love the book and and um, I just love the content in it. And it's so you know she's got uh, three at least three books that I, I remember. Um, and this is the one that kind of came from the other two, where the other two were like, okay, this is good, but I need something a little bit more practical and then the next one came out and it's like ah, i need something a little bit more practical and this was kind of like birthed out of that like all right you can read this in a in a couple hours and and actually make a big difference in your life and then maybe go read the other two books so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so all right well thanks for for joining me it's been fun um and, yeah and, uh, absolutely thanks okay. for letting me rant a yeah, little yeah, bit and <laughs> a, went a little longer than i planned but uh, or i yeah. thought but uh, um, I think it was it was good. So very good conversation. Absolutely.